Welcome everyone to On Podcast, the you know, Microsoft Podcast, where we talk about Microsoft stuff on a podcast. And we are back. Uh, we are here in the new year to bring you some new information. We got tons of stuff. Uh, in the time we took off, CES happened, and uh, there's a lot of information that we're going to be covering today regarding that conference that nobody went to. Yeah, we're kicking 22 off, 2022 off with a bang, with a bang of news about Intel and AMD and folding laptops and other cool laptops that uh, some of us had a chance to go hands on with and some of us had a chance to write about. And also talking about the Surface Duo, which is not dead yet because we could be getting some big updates in a few weeks. Yeah, and before we start everything off, let's get acquainted with us again. For those of you who are new, I'm your co-host, Kareem Anderson. I'm joined by the world's greatest co-host. Arif Bacchus. How could we forget that, right? Right, it's been two weeks, so <laughs> we're a little bit rusty. But uh, yeah, we'll just kind of go over some of the quick uh, head po- headlines for this, just so you guys can, you know, if you want to skip ahead, you'll know where to go. So we'll start off, like you said, mentioning some of the uh, CES news, which involves Intel and AMD. Uh, where, like you said, mentioned folding laptops. Uh, there are some other cool laptops that include dual screens, uh, eco-friendly stuff, sustainability on the on the brain. Surface Duo news, which includes both Duo One and Duo Two, as far as updates and software is concerned. Then we're going to jump into our fast recap, which uh, we'll get into the Windows 11 Insider builds, image editor, and photo apps, and uh, you know, basically inbox apps, getting some updates. Uh, then this Google sets news uh, that's actually tangential to what Microsoft is doing with their fast pairing. And then we'll jump into the week ahead where we talk more about Surface Laptop stuff. Uh, the SC, I believe our uh, editor-in-chief has gotten one, so he'll probably be writing about that and you know how that differs between the Surface Laptop Go. Uh, and then we'll also be kind of kicking off anything about uh, any Windows 11's problems. Uh, and lastly, any new hardware, anything that we're gonna be reviewing uh, in the upcoming weeks. And I'll let you get started with our first topic, which is, well, it's kind of two topics combined in one, but they're related. Intel has new CPUs for the year, and AMD also has new CPUs for the year. And depending on, is we were talking about this off camera, depending on which side of the battle you stand on, one might be considered more powerful than the other. Yeah, uh, AMD and Intel are going to be duking it out alongside Apple's M1. So, you know, 2022 is going to be very powerful year for laptops. Uh, we'll just see you know, who comes out on top. But regarding Wintel, uh, which I'll be covering, uh, we were introduced to 12th gen core mobile CPUs uh, for laptops, essentially. Like uh, Intel kind of touted their you know, M1 killers back in the fall, uh, but those were mainly for desktops that needed yep. super crazy cooling. So uh, somehow they've you know gotten that die down and gotten it into a small device. Uh, which, and I believe they're all delayed or taking uh, AMD type or uh, uh, ARM type uh, engineering. I mean, it's not specifically ARM, but they are using the uh, back and forth core processing uh, as far as uh, what they're going to be doing with these. Uh, these new 12th gen mobile chips, uh, I believe the Core i7s and i9s, uh, will be the H series, uh, which are the super powerful ones. Uh, these are going to be in the top end. Uh, probably paired with anywhere between 16 and 32 gigabytes of RAM most, in most devices. So just keep that in mind uh, as we go through this. They're, Intel's claiming that the fastest mobile processors ever and the world's mo- best mobile gaming platforms. Uh, they will be giving us 14 CPU cores with a uh, five, 5 gigahertz maximum turbo frequency and up to 20 uh, threads uh, being used at once. Intel promises up to 20% faster gaming performance as well compared to the Core i9s. Uh, and uh, up to 43% higher performance in 3D rendering uh, generation over generation. So uh, again, these are going to be some really powerful ones, um, but uh, what Intel kind of failed to explain as well is that these uh, that all this power and performance isn't coming down to the i7s that you and I were going to be getting or the i5s that are going to be probably paired and everything that Microsoft puts out or any other manufacturer, at least for the ones that are going to be relatively affordable when yep. you're uh, anywhere between your $500 and $1,100, $1,200 uh, price range. Everything beyond that, we'll be getting the more powerful i7s and i9s that will be seeing all of this uh, great performance. And the other thing uh, that they did mention at CES was uh, when we can expect to see, uh, I believe, their P and uh, U series, uh, because H's are the ones that are coming out in like the first quarter. So, uh, you know, in between January, uh, February, and March will be uh, these super powerful ones. 
But for you know, but most consumers, uh, we'll be seeing April and beyond with whom we're getting the U's and P's for all the like Lenovo yogos and yogas and things like that. Uh, the other thing to note is that uh, Intel is going to be supporting all of the latest uh, PC standards, essentially. So we'll be getting some DDR. A five LPD DDR5 uh, as far as uh, memory is concerned, so a, a faster uh, support memory for that. We'll be getting Wi-Fi 6E, Thunderbolt 4 uh, natively supported. Uh, I believe that they're still going to be using their uh, Iris XE graphics. Uh, yeah. I don't think they bumped those up uh, at all, but I mean, as of last year, they were pretty impressive, uh, at least for an integrated GPU. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to look forward to coming from uh, Intel. Uh, the two questions that remain are how they manage heat, because like we said, these are taken from desktop versions, which uh, when we noted back in the fall, really required some creative uh, uh, heat dissipation uh, solutions. So we'll see how these new uh, versions run. Uh, and battery life. That's another thing they haven't talked about is battery life. Uh, they talked about power and performance, but the thing that makes an M1 so tantalizing to people is that not only does it come with uh, per watch performance, but it also uh, manages battery, it's, you know, crazy, crazy good. So we'll see if Intel can come anywhere near that. It announced a 22 12th gen CPU. So one of those CPUs has to be focused on battery, right? It's probably one of those Pentium or those Celeron chips that you find in low end Chromebooks like the and uh, like the Surface Laptop SE, where you're supposedly supposed to get performance as well as good battery life. Yeah, I mean, uh, not to knock anything below like the i5 or anything like that, but the Pentiums and Celerons, I've, I've you know used them Surface Go 2, and they are pretty decent uh, for you know what you're paying for, what you get. So if there's an uh, improvement to those, uh, all the more power to it. And we can definitely see Microsoft trying to use those chips to get back into uh, education, which uh, I believe... Uh, Kip will be talking about when he goes over his review of the uh, laptop SE. And now's the time for you AMD fans to tune in because we're done know, with Wintel. Take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they announced their brand new Ryzen 6000 series mobile processors, and it brings together the company's Zen 3 Plus core architecture with AMD's RDNA 2 integrated graphics. And these new Ryzen 6000 series mobile CPUs are leveraging the TSMC's uh, 6 nanometer manufacturing process, which our friends at Intel have yet to get to. So again, it seems like they're packing a lot of performance into their new CPUs, but that's not the only thing. They also worked with Microsoft on these because all of the new Ryzen 6000 series mobile processors have what's known as the Microsoft Pluton security chip inside. And we, I believe we talked about this a couple of years ago, probably a year and a half ago when we first heard the rumors about Pluton and if, if you forgot or if you didn't tune in back then, Pluton is essentially a security chip, kind of like what Apple has, the T2 security chips on its PCs. And it's also kind of like what you had in Xbox with uh, Azure Sphere. And it's supposed to store sensitive information like encryption keys and credentials and make it harder for attackers to access your personal information. So that is one tidbit from the AMD news. Yeah, uh, they also announced, uh, I believe, the Ryzen 6. Uh, I mean, you already said that, the Ryzen 6 yeah. series. But uh, they have the entry-level U series U as well. Series. Uh, which, again, I think, you know, they're you know they're coming out with the big guns for all the performance stuff. But, you know, what we're actually going to be probably getting in a lot of these devices are the the U's and the, the P's for, for some of these devices. Uh, the one thing I, I kind of wanted to kind of make sure that we, we noted was that uh, while AMD is tagging a lot of its performance, it's usually uh, market uh, when it's plugged in. All right. So, yeah. and this the same thing for Intel for the most part. So, uh, you know, if, you know, all these long, these elongated battery claims that they they're saying that you get with some of these uh, performance chips uh, need to be taken with a grain of salt. I wrote about this because uh, over the last I don't know four or five years, we've seen AMD regularly throttle the devices when uh, on battery. So you lose a lot of that performance. Uh, but once it's plugged in, I mean, you're flying through stuff. Uh, they, you know, it, uh, they do what they claim they can do, but just keep that in mind. Uh, as far as some of the details on it, uh, do you want to kind of go over the CPU cores that people are going to be able to play around with? 
Yeah, uh, these new Ryzen Pro processors, uh, which will power some of the devices that we're about to talk to in the next segment, which is uh, one of them is the Lenovo ThinkPad Z series. Uh, these have up to eight CPU cores and 16 threads, and AMD promises that there will be up to 11% more single-threaded performance and up to 28% faster multi-threaded performance over the previous generations. And I'm not sure what that is, but seems like it's a, a bit a slight improvement between generations there. And the Ryzen 6000 mobile processors also come with some of the same features as Intel, minus the Thunderbolt technology, of course. So you're getting DDR5, PCIe 4.0, USB 4, and Wi-Fi 6E. And they expect over 200 new laptops to use these new chips in the year 2022. Again, which is another shot at Intel, which usually dominates the market with their devices. Now it seems like AMD is also trying to get their fair share. Uh, I mean, aside from the performance claims, the other big interesting thing is the, like you said, the uh, auxiliary support for all of the standards. I think it's always yep. one of the things that's kind of held uh, AMD back is that Intel uh, not only does it support just standards, but it creates its own, which locks out AMD. So when you go get any, if you have just uh, a choice between an AMD uh, device and an Intel one, you get the Intel one that supports more things for you to do with versus the AMD one, which might give you power, might give you better battery, but you're not able to necessarily plug in uh, dual 4K monitors or your uh, generation behind on Bluetooth support, stuff like that. So uh, it's good to see that, you know, uh, if Microsoft does decide to make or support both uh, chipsets in their devices or any other manufacturer, that you're not going to be losing out on all of the support stuff that comes with these. So we just talked about the chips that are inside new laptops. So why don't we talk about the new laptops themselves? I know you had a chance to write about these folding laptops in your CS recap. What are your thoughts? I know there were two folding laptops, one from Asus, which will actually become a product later this year, and then another awesome concept from Samsung. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the Asus one, which is called, I believe, the ZenBook 17 Fold OLED, uh, looks from all accounts, it looks like the ThinkPad X1 Fold, to be honest with you. Yep. Uh, it's about uh, as thick. Uh, it has kind of the uh, uh, two-tone or two-double material cover. Uh, you, you know, you just don't have a regular carbon fiber or any kind of like that. You have a fabric kind of cover on it. Uh, it also comes with a detachable keyboard as well. It can stand in both uh, landscape and portrait modes. I believe it has a kickstand for or to keep it in that orientation as well. Uh, I think it does come with a pin and box. So, I mean, if any of you had a chance to kind of either see a review of the ThinkPad or get your hands on one yourself, maybe play around with it or something like that, uh, that's pretty much what it has. Uh, as far as the actual specs on it, uh, there is a 4 by 3 17.3 inch, 2.5K resolution screen on it. So it's uh, just a mouthful, but it's, it's really, you know, <laughs> they're giving you a lot for that. Uh, you also uh, be able to create a seam, which will make it a three by two aspect ratio, uh, and gives you, uh, as I believe, the nineteen twenty by twelve eighty display uh, in that fold. Um, like I said, I believe they're they're calling it the ErgoSense Bluetooth keyboard, uh, which is great. Uh, that way, you don't have to necessarily be like the Surface, where you have to have always have it connected. Yep. Which I believe Surface should really look into that. They should start making more Bluetooth keyboards. They're going to charge us that much. This is uh, what Microsoft was trying to do with the Surface Neo. Everything you just described is literally <laughs> what Microsoft just canceled a couple of years ago, especially the keyboard, which was magnetic and would snap on the bottom screen and give you like a physical. Uh, trackpad. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we're going to be getting is the 12th generation U series. Like I said, those are going to be coming yeah. out a little bit later in the year. Uh, Core i7 processor with the Iris X graphics. Uh, you're going to be getting two USB Thunderbolt 4 points uh, ports to you know, keep things charged or transfer data. Um, I believe that's all we know so far for it. I mean, we'll, we'll be getting some more details uh, you know, in the coming months closer to its release. Uh, but like I said, it's it's fun. I just don't know if Windows 11 is, is ready, ready for, for, yeah. for foldables. And I don't, and I say that interestingly enough because it, this foldable is more like the Samsung Galaxy Fold where you don't necessarily have two dedicated uh, panels. You have just one continuous one. Uh, and, you know, obviously Windows works well on one continuous screen and it works on multi, uh, multiple monitors. So it's just going to be interesting to see how people navigate with their fingers because that's how this thing is really designed to, to be 
held and folded and played with and manipulated with. Uh, Microsoft needs a lot of work for, I believe, Windows 11 on touch. I mean, it looks great on a, on a Surface laptop studio where you can use your mouse and things like that, or a pen, but I don't know about touch on these things. What are, what are you thinking? I don't feel it. I don't feel like it's ready. I mean, rounded corners are nice, um, but I don't think rounded corners go well with foldable displays just quite yet, which is why Samsung ha- showed off the Flex Note, which is just a concept about how future laptops could have foldable displays. It's essentially a like a Galaxy Z Fold, but supersized up to 17 inches and with, with the same OLED technology. And they didn't really have a lot of details about it. Uh, Sam Mobile had a story where they were able to touch it, but it was just like a display looping the same video over and over again. It's nothing too fancy to get on about, which is... I think Samsung is is pretty safe on not actually releasing a foldable laptop yet because, like you said, Windows 11 isn't ready for it. Maybe in a year or two when we get few, because now the Windows 11 updates are once a year instead of being twice a year like how it was in Windows 10 a couple of years ago. So Microsoft would need to work closely with its partners to ensure that the operating system is ready for the hardware itself. Yeah, they, they, there's a lot of window management that needs to be done uh, on in Windows 11 if it's going to be designed for touch, stuff that needs to be intuitive. Like, I shouldn't have to necessarily drag every window from the top. Right, uh, yeah, to the they, bottom. To, yeah, should, you know, the same way that they did with the Duo. Like, they take a lot of the heavy lifting off of window management in the Duo by letting you snap things automatically, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be seeing some more improvements on that. Uh and maybe Samsung, you know, it's a concept, but they've been throwing concepts out since uh, of foldables for like the last four or five years. And I believe they have a trifold, which might actually be better. It might be something that they can look into replacing their Galaxy Tab with, with this trifold uh, Android version of, of a tablet with pin support and things like that. Maybe that's their new note. Uh, versus they also had that them. crazy trifold monitor that was like three monitors stacked on top of each other that was also like curved. So Samsung yeah. is known for doing crazy things at CES. So keep your eye on them, but also keep your eye on Microsoft and make sure that they get revive Windows 10X and bring it back for these new wave of te- uh, foldable PCs that people are planning. Well, I mean, if, even if you don't keep your eye on Microsoft, <laughs> we got, uh, w- w- what's this in the doc? We have our... I believe RG, ROG Flow Z13. Yeah, I know. They're doing stuff that Microsoft is not doing, which is putting a RTX uh, caliber GPU in a tablet and uh, get you a tablet that could do some quote-unquote real gaming that's not just playing Fortnite. Yeah, it sports a 14-core Intel i9. Uh, yeah. That's pretty impressive. Uh, one uh, one two nine zero zero H processor, an NVIDIA GeForce R, like you said, RTX thirty fifty Ti GPU, which I believe is the same one that, or is that? Uh, I think it's one less or ten less than the the one in the service laptop studio. Is that a thirty? Same one, same one, same one. So I mean, think about that. Think about how thick the Surface Laptop Studio is versus what this tablet will be. Uh, they're also going to be uh, supporting fifty two hundred megahertz. Uh, LPDDR5 memory, so it's going to be even a little faster than what you get in the Surface laptop or even a lot of the devices for 20, from the end of 2021. Uh, display options include 4K 60 hertz uh, with 85% DCI P3 uh, uh, color accuracy and coverage. Uh, you'll, get, uh, you'll also be able to get a full HD 120 hertz screen uh, with 100% sRGB gambit. Uh, both panels are rated at 500 nits. Again, there's they're bringing out all the specs in this thing. <laughs> Sports Dolby Vision HDR, and just tuned for the uh, 16 by 10 aspect ratio. So you basically just take the MacBook screen off of the keyboard, and that's basically what you're going to be getting with this thing, with a what? little bit more power. My colleague at the other publication that I work for was on the ground at CES, and he actually got to touch this thing. And he said it was pretty amazing. And he kind of felt like it, it, he said it was very heavy and it was a pretty sturdy thing. It doesn't feel the same way that like a Surface Pro. Surface Pros are very light, but with 3050 Ti graphics in there, you're, ex- you're expecting it to be heavy. And he's like, but one thing that let him down was the kickstand because Microsoft nailed that technology where it's like endless. You could move it down as much as you want but when he tried it out he said that this kickstand sucks because it only could go down to 170 (laughs) degrees so one thing that uh 
Acer, uh, what is it? Republic of Gamers can't get right is the kickstand. Maybe in a couple of years, you might see Microsoft take the same thing and pop a graphics card in there. Who knows? Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, though, it's, it's for gaming. So how low do you need your screen to go? You you basically yeah, sure. wanted it. You basically wanted it at 90, 90, 90 degrees. degrees. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this thing, uh, if, if it were going to be an all purpose device for gaming and drawing, then yes. But if this was. You know, something that you're just going to be tossing a backpack and then plug other peripherals into it and let it be your desktop. I mean, like I said, we're dragging around a, a four and a half, five pound Surface Laptop Studio, and if you can yep. drag this tablet thing around for maybe three pounds, and it does all of the you know creative uh, stuff you need to and all the production stuff. That's a win-win. So I mean, I, I'm excited to see how this progresses, and maybe with Gen Two, which is maybe you know maybe that's a little thinner, or maybe uh, everyone starts to meet in the middle. Maybe Microsoft starts, you know. <laughs> Making the you know, we've already seen the Surface Pro get a little thicker, so maybe they're you know future proofing this, and, and maybe next generation will get we'll finally get a, an NVIDIA in that Surface Pro 8 body. So, did you hear yeah. about the laptop that has a tablet in the laptop and is also <laughs> super wide? Because that was another wild we're, we're talking about our favorite uh, laptops from CES, so that was also another favorite laptop of ours. I know you're close with Lenovo, so I'll let you grab this one. Yeah, so we're talking about all this like tablet PC. How about just having a PC and a in tablet, a tablet. <laughs> in one body? You know, it's crazy. So what they've done, uh, Lenovo is, is doing. They're getting a little Samsungish, and they they've created the ThinkBook Plus Three. This thing uh, incorporates an eight-inch full LCD on the left side, right side. I mean, right side, right the, side, right side of your keyboard deck. So where we got the, I believe it was the Asus, was it? Uh, ZenBook, something or other, that crazy Asus creative. ZenBook Duo, which had the screen under the keyboard. Yeah. Well, no, even, and then there was the, what was the other one that had the keyboard, that had the screen above the keyboard? Either way, all, yeah. of, these, all of these dual screen devices, they're deciding to put it uh, uh, vertically, I mean, uh, horizontally on the keyboard deck so that people who, you know, it seems to be for right-handed people, who want to draw things like that and get a little more accurate, but don't want to touch the screen, will not be able to have it right there on the keyboard deck. It's, it's a cool thing. Uh, I believe it's a 17-inch uh, laptop in order to incorporate all this, and it has a 21 by 10 aspect ratio. Uh, it, it also will, I believe, have uh, the, the screen itself, not the panel. Uh, the screen itself will be a 30, 72 by 14, 40 resolution, so you're going to be getting a, pre a pretty nice screen, a main screen, versus the eight inch one as well. Uh, I do believe it does come with a housed, a, a housed, uh, what do you call it? A pen. Integrated uh, pen in the in chassis in the back, yeah. Like the yes. yogas do? Correct. Uh, I have a beefy, you know, 12th gen uh, Core H series, which we've been talking about, you know, we'll continue to talk about. I think it can be configured up to 32 gigabytes of that, you know, fast memory we've been talking about, and two terabytes of uh, SSD storage. So this thing is meant to be uh, basically, uh, you know, your workstation, a desktop. You're not really meant to move it around because it's a 17-inch laptop. Uh, it also has an FH, uh, FHD infrared camera, uh, and I believe it'll have support for Windows Hello with that as well. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Lenovo likes to par partner with Harman Kardon, so you'll be getting Harman Kardon uh, Adobe Atmos speaker arrangements uh, with this as well. So for if you're doing any kind of video editing, you don't feel like wearing a headset, and you just want to hear the audio as clear as possible, uh, you'll be able to do that on this thing. So it's, I mean, it's hard for us to describe. You have to see this thing because the, uh, the LCD panel is super clear. It's really nice. It's just, uh, it's, and I think they also mentioned in their press release some of the applications for this, the, you know, practical applications as far as like maybe having a dedicated calculator uh, that you can touch screen. You know, I, I use my uh, keyboard and a little mouse, the numbering pad over here, but to be able to, you know, kind of dedicate uh, an actual calculator aside from that. Uh, I believe they also said that you'll be able to uh, transfer uh, screen mirroring and you'll be able to elongate the screen. So if you have a web page that, you know, is super long and this, you know, you need to take a screenshot or anything like that, but you don't feel like scrolling, part of that will be displayed on this 8-inch uh, screen as well. So it's just crazy how uh, they're going to be incorporating all these new things and all this new tech. I actually got to try it at an event in New York a couple of days ago, and I'm telling you, this thing is wild. Windows treats the tablet as a second display, so you could literally drag anything you want over. It's really cool to have, uh, because of that wide screen, you could have like 
I think I, I put five different edge windows on that super wide screen and then I dragged the sixth one down to the tablet itself and I was scrolling like crazy and then you also could take notes with the Lenovo thing. There's this special color pen that they have that could match the color on the screen and then give you the ink on the tablet itself. It's It's really wild stuff and we need to see it to believe it. Hopefully, this is one of those things that they put in Best Buy that everyone will be circled around and fighting to get a chance to play with. I mean, it's Lenovo. <laughs> they they, ha- they have the prowess to do it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm hoping people get a chance to be like, oh, you know, I kind of want this. And another thing that I also got to play with, uh, at not at CES, but before CES and at these uh, press briefings, is Dell's new XPS 13+. Plus. Uh, this is yeah, a you're the Dell guy. I, I'm the Dell guy, you're the Lenovo guy. We got both ends of the stick right here. Yeah. So the uh, XPS 13 Plus is a new version of the XPS 13, and it is redesigning the pro- the popular perfect laptop. It comes with Intel's new Alder Lake processors under their hood and a new haptic glass touchpad, kind of the same one that you could find in the Surface Laptop Studio. And it starts at 1200 no, sorry, two thousand dollars, which is a hefty price to pay. But you're getting a lot of new stuff here. It's all about embracing simplicity as the new premium. That is the tagline for the laptop. And they stripped away the XPS's classic dual tone carbon fiber interior finish for a more simple design, and it still keeps the fantastic edge to edge infinity edge display. But now there's no more carbon fiber on the inside, and it kind of looks more like a MacBook would where you have that interior aluminum finish all the way around, and it comes in either platinum or graphite. And the other big change, like we were talking about at the top of the show, is 28-watt Intel processors. Previously, you only would get 15 watts, so you're getting more more performance for a higher price. And the processors come with either 12, 12, or 14 cores. Again, you're getting Core i5, Core i7, or the high-end Core i7. And you're also getting 8, 16, or 32 gigabytes of RAM, which which is pretty decent for multitasking for an ultrabook of this size. And even though the XPS is more powerful, it's still the same size as before. And they've also enlarged the fans on board to give you more airflow. And speaking of airflow, one thing that they did do is they removed the top row of the keyboard. And it's now like those haptic t- uh, buttons that you would get like like uh, on the Xbox One where you touch the power button. It's not a physical button. It's just a touch button. So all of those control keys are now touch buttons and kind of like mimicking what Apple did with the MacBook Pro. And this is one of my favorite laptops from CS because it really just looks so beautiful when you see it in person. So- yeah, speaking of looks, because uh, you went over a lot of the specs, but just the outward appearance has been basically overhauled. And uh, I believe some folks over at The Verge and some other people who have got a chance to play with it are questioning whether or not the design needed to be touched to begin with. Uh, as you said, this is, uh, or I guess Dell's marketing thing is it was, uh, an update or what was it, uh, a new a redesigned version of the perfect laptop. So, you know, some of the things that I, I noted were uh, the super flush keys. All right. Um, and the Dell says, yeah, Dell says that they kept the one millimeter uh, key travel. I don't know if I, I didn't get a chance to touch it myself, but. What they've done is they spread out the key uh, and they made it thinner. It's flush with the deck itself, so it may be feeling weird to type on. It may feel more like glass, I suppose, uh, but we'll see if they keep that uh, that going with it. And it, it will also remind you of the butterfly keyboard, so we'll see if, they're, if they have any issues with the keys themselves. The other thing that they changed was they got rid of uh, the, I guess, surrounding border of the keyboard. Basically, just like the screen, the keyboard goes flush with, yeah. with, the, with the body, so that's going to be something to get interested uh, in. Uh, I guess used to, uh, if, you, if you're used to you know, kind of having some space around uh, the way you type. Uh, the other thing that they also changed uh, was uh, the deck itself. Um, I believe the bottom part where the, the touchpad is at is one piece. Uh, there's no delineation between what is trackpad and what is the body. So users yeah. will have to get used to where the area, uh, the touch area actually ends and begins. So That'll be some kind of exploration, but you know, hey, who knows? I There's like also say, no headphone jack. They removed the headphone jack. All you have is USB C. The, the micro SD card as well. Yep. So you have to get used to that as well. So I mean, for 
a little bit more power and you know what is arguably a, a newer better design uh these are some of the changes we want to ease to and speaking of changes our fourth topic is the surface duo which could be seeing some changes soon with android 11. yeah uh well first off uh we got news earlier uh this week about android 11 finally coming to the original duo within the f next few weeks so who knows what that means <laughs> maybe maybe we'll get it by <laughs> build i have no idea maybe by but february or march if we're lucky if we're lucky but you know as we left off i think we left you guys with microsoft is uh they left it they left the approval process certification of the update for the duo uh, the original duo in google's hands uh everybody went on break including microsoft and uh, google employees so it's kind of been sitting in limbo but i believe people are coming back in the office this week they'll definitely for sure mostly be a capacity next week for both companies so uh, expect to see maybe the update by the end of this month, as you mentioned. Uh, the other thing that we'll be seeing uh, for the Duo, um, I guess the original Duo and even this new Duo, is 12L. Uh, Microsoft has been rumored, and this is a big rumor, this is coming from uh, Zach Bowden over at Windows Central and people close to the matter, is that Microsoft is going to skip, with, with, uh, I guess, Android 12. I believe that Duo 2 comes with Android 11. They're going to skip 12 altogether and go for 12L, which is, I believe, an accompaniment to 12. So they're not skipping a whole uh, version. They're just kind of doing the one that makes most the sense. Specialized for the version the, that's the supposed, specialized version. supposed to yeah. be for dual screen devices. Yeah, uh, it, it's it is for, it's it's main it's mainly for foldables. But it does have a few tweaks in there for Microsoft's dual screen purposes. Uh, the majority of this stuff will be redundant uh, as far as Microsoft's Duo is concerned uh, for anybody who has a Duo. Uh, but it will be baked into the system, which means that Microsoft won't have to necessarily update these things uh, on its end. It won't have to do all the heavy lifting. And maybe we'll get faster system updates uh, if they can just rely on uh, Google's native code to kind of do all of the window management that's supposed to be coming with it, all of the notification management uh, and uh, screen placement, uh, all that stuff that's supposed to be baked in and help developers' lives be a little easier and help navigating uh, larger screens, larger than six inches, uh, easier for most consumers. So uh, we don't know, you know, you know, given what Microsoft's track record is with updates and the Duo, we could probably expect the Duo 12 update to come out sometime in the fall. Uh, if we don't, I believe I wrote some predictions. We don't expect a Duo 3, so unfortunately we won't be seeing a new device launch with it, so this might give Microsoft even less incentive to, <laughs> to send out the update. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll be getting it uh, at the end of uh, the summer or something like that. I know that uh, Samsung has already been testing some devices with it, so they're, they're already on board. I believe that it was released about, uh, right before Christmas or so. Uh, to some to some developers and to some manufacturers, they probably had it for a couple of months. So uh, we're hoping to see 12L come to uh, the Duo and the Duo 2 uh, in the next few months. And I think we hit all of our main topics, which means it's time for fast recap. And for fast recap, we're just talking about everything Windows 11 for this first week of the new year. Yeah, uh, we got a new build. Uh, what was it yesterday? I think it was January 6th. Yeah, yesterday. There we go. We got a new build, uh, which brought about nothing for us Windows fans. But for anybody who is using uh, AirPods, I uh, believe, or uh, audio through one of uh, Apple's codecs, I uh, believe Windows, this new Windows 11 Insider build is testing support for that. Uh, it should be, I believe, making it easier for the specific fast pairing, I think it is, something like that, with yeah. uh, their Bluetooth headphones, things like that. So... Uh, that's something to look forward to. Everything else was uh, a few fixes and a few things to kind of keep an eye out for and some, some workarounds for some things that they've actually broken. So if you want all that information, go check out the write-up we have for it uh, at the website. Uh, the other thing that came in was the image editor. I'll let you talk about that one. Yeah, Windows 11's uh, image editor now has, uh, not image editor, Windows 11's photo app now has a new image editor. And that, that was courtesy of the folks at XDA Developers. They spotted this first. And it's pretty nice because now there are, it's easier to mark up images, change the aspect ratio, crop images, and even adjust filters. Uh, it's mainly a quality of life improvement. The image editor in Windows 10 
the, and the photos happen windows 10 always had these features but now it's just moving them to more clearly marked places and cleaning things up and giving it a nicer look and i used it a couple times i was writing articles for ces coverage and to have that uh crop tool uh more front and center and not like in a sidebar and directly under your image it makes things super easy and super clean yeah, and I also believe it's following the uh, design language of uh, the Snip and Sketch or whatnot. Yep. So it's all uh, Windows 11 design language. Exactly. So you'll know where to kind of uh, move your eyes to uh, uh, when you navigate, you know, across multiple apps. You know, that was one of the issues that we had with Windows 8 and Windows uh, 10 was that you had UI elements kind of all over the place, depending on the app developer or when the app was developed by Microsoft. Uh, if, you know, cropping tools are all at the top of all image uh, things, and if we get a video editor and all these kind of things are at the top, you know, kind of how to intuitively navigate these things. Uh, the other thing that we got was uh, Groove Music as being uh, tested and replaced by <laughs> Media Player. Uh, Microsoft rolled out uh, uh, its new Media Player for Windows 11 uh, last fall for insiders. Uh, now it's extending that rollout to more people, and it's also... Uh, doing the app link switch basically so when you go into microsoft store and you see groove app as an update you hit that once it's updated it will initiate the windows media uh player what used to happen and i believe i you know, had up until about a week ago was that both set uh set next to each other parallel and did and duplicated uh, uh uh functionality the other issue that we have is that they still you know windows groove media player uh music player is still in the system so you can open it. Uh, you can open some uh, applications with it, and it'll launch it. Uh, but for the most part, it seems to be kicking over to the new media player. And the new media player is very nice. For so those of you who haven't had a chance to uh, play around with it, it does keep the color scheme of, of Groove, uh, but it is done away with a lot of the Metro slash Zoom UI that was lingering and kind of given way to this new Microsoft UI design, which I actually appreciate. Uh, you know, It doesn't uh, have a lot of wasted space, in my opinion. And it's getting, it gained some functionality that uh, was hard and kind of hidden in the Groove uh, Music uh, Groove Music Player. Some of the things like uh, downloading metadata from the cloud has been made uh, more visible. Uh, being able to cast the casting menu has been uh, filled out with a lot more devices and, and more supported hardware. Uh, the other thing you get is that it incorporates uh, both your movies or your video files and your music files as well, and you get cool like thumbnails for all of that stuff. It's you know to me I think it's great. It'll be a great replacement to finally get rid of also the Windows slash 7, 8. The Windows Media 8, Player 10. that's been there for like since Windows XP. Exactly. Hopefully we'll be able to finally get rid of that once we get all the uh, supported codecs. Uh, and we'll just have this one thing. The one thing I do want to note is I want to see if they will actually get rid of TV and movies or whatever that app is. And just kind of shift all that stuff into this app because it'd be great. Then people will be like, Microsoft is putting an ad in my media player. I don't like ads. <laughs> of course. I mean, they're going to say that regardless, <laughs> but I'd like to be able to just have the one app versus having to go to movie and TV and having that launch into the store and a bunch of other stuff. Just build that into this thing. It's a media player. It's, it's in the title. And that said, there's also another piece of news here for, that came not at CS but during CS, which is Google planning to make Android phones work better with Windows through their new quote-unquote fast pair feature. It's something that Google is going hard on for. Apparently, they're pairing everything with fast pair now on Chromebooks and Windows, and this is supposed to be a lot like what you get on Chrome OS, where you'll be able to fast pair your Android phone to select new Windows PCs from HP and Asus, and you'll be able to get your text messages as well as your photos and your and other content from your phone on your Windows PC. They didn't talk a lot about how it would work. I'm assuming it's over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but Seems like another way of Google uh, slapping Microsoft in the face and be like, ha, you have your phone, but now we have our own thing too. They already did this earlier when they announced that they're bringing Google Play games, which are essentially Android games, to Windows. And now they're also doing the same thing. They're now bringing your Android text messages and your Android photos and everything from your Android phone over to your Windows PC. Yeah, I'm interested in how they implement <laughs> this because, I mean, if I could roll my eyes any harder, I would, but uh, they you can already do most of this functionality through the web, uh, so I'm, right. I'm wondering 
if in Chrome, they'll just start giving you kind of directors to, and again, this is what Edge gets docked for, kind of ushering and, and, and uh, putting people or shooing people towards where they need to. And if this is going to be a web-based kind of uh, application versus a dedicated app like your phone uh, to get this kind of uh, native uh, pairing. So I don't think, like you said, do it over Wi-Fi, do it through Bluetooth. Uh, it's a good question just on the air. And even if we're going to get it this year, they just said they're working on it. So again, if for those of you who are longing to get this app, just go to the browser, type in messages.android.com <laughs> so you can get your text messages, go to Google Photos. and just Photos, go use, yeah. Yeah, and you can use Edge, by the way. You can even you use OneDrive for all that. You you sync OneDrive as a, over the web and you get all of your your photos on your Android phone or right on your PC. You don't need Google. Yeah, no. And like I said, if you want to, just use Edge and, and save, save them as apps, by the way. And yep. you'll be able to have, that's what I do. I have uh, messages down to my taskbar and I'm able to kind of get my message off my phone already. So Google, thank you, but uh, no thank you. <laughs> and with that said, our fast recap is finished and we thank you for listening to our fast recap. And that means it's time for our week ahead segment. Yeah, uh, what we have in the week ahead is, what do we have in the week ahead? So much, so many stuff that you're confused, but yes, in no, week ahead. True. <laughs> it's usually at the bottom of the dock, but here we go. Yeah. Week ahead, we have our Surface Laptop SE review, I believe, or at least first impressions from our uh, editor-in-chief. Uh, I believe uh, you... Or, uh, I ordered or, one, and he also ordered one, but he got his first, and he put so up they, a... He put up a post of his initial impressions, and we're planning to dive a dig a bit a bit deeper into Surface Laptop SE and get into all the technicalities of using Microsoft's education tools and setting it up like as a education laptop and see all the limits of PWAs and UWPs and Win32 apps and diving deeper into all the technicalities of how hard is it to use a education laptop as a average person. Yeah, this is this would be interesting and very informative to be honest with you. Uh, again, we're seeing, unfortunately, uh, in uh, I believe homeschool and, and virtual learning is coming back uh, for right now. So you know, this could be a great time for Microsoft to you know recapture some of that lost market share it had uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, uh, with Chromebooks kind of you know surging and exploding. Uh, and you know, if we're finding ourselves back in that situation, it'll be interesting to see if the SE is the laptop to go with. Uh, I have some reviews still. I believe I have some ThinkPads to kind of go over. I have the, one of the Legions as well to kind of review. I've been putting it off, sadly. Uh, and I That's how you that... know it's good. It's like when you're taking forever to do your review. Like, I like this too much. <laughs> I need longer to play with it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, there's just so much to write about. Like, you know, you start you start an outline for, for a review and you're like, oh, I can add this. I can add this. Oh, <laughs> this, this broke. Now I got to add this and revise all that. So, uh, hopefully we get those reviews out, but I do want to say that I want to thank everybody again, like you said, for being with us. Uh, you can find me uh, at Minehead1 on Twitter. Where can people find you? A back Jern. Yeah, and for those of you who, again, want to catch up on all the news and information you might have missed over the holiday uh, break, uh, you can go to onmicrosoft.com or you can visit our Twitter, which is at onmicrosoft, again, for latest headlines, reviews. We're going to start doing some giveaways. I got to start talking to some of our partners and getting you guys some devices and some things and hold some contests as well. Uh, we also have poll weekly polls we're going to start rebringing back. Uh, we're also going to be asking you guys for questions to, uh, to have on the show. And all that stuff can be found on Twitter. Uh, for those of you who are gamers, you can go to Pinterest. I believe we have a writer who's been keeping that updated as far as gaming and, and all kinds of pins and content. Uh, we're trying to grow our Instagram as well. So if you want to just see some... Uh, clips from the the podcast you don't necessarily want to watch the whole thing you can go there as well uh but again i want to say thank you to everybody who is coming back with us uh for this second season of our of our podcast and uh for those of you who have been here forever thanks thank you yeah you make the show possible because after all we do it all for you yeah and for you new people thank you as well uh stay safe out there everybody and we'll see you again next week see you again soon same place same time